Right, hello. I apologize for the brief technical glitch. My name is Andrew Martin. I'm from YLD, a London-based node consultancy. And I have done many things in my time, everywhere from small startups to large enterprises. And I want to talk a little bit about why those projects have failed. So working as a dev, a DBA, a tester, an ops guy, an architect, DevOps is the glue between all of those processes. So this talk will contain some direction for one-man armies, large distributed teams, and will contain some opinionated recommendations and processes from the ecosystem and my own anecdotal experience. Some time-saving tips, and ultimately aiming for maximum project velocity. There is no one-size-fits-all solution, so I will aim to be as generic and abstract as possible. So, what is the big scary problem we're looking to solve? The inability to ship code. We, the individuals, the business, we are scared of the unknown. We don't trust our tools and processes. We're afraid of touching anything, and when we do try to make something better, bad things happen. I feel this pain. Teetering on the wire, performing tricks, is no way to live. We deserve our nine to five, shipping quality code, going home on time, and having our weekends carefree. So, spoiler alert. This talk, <laughs> this talk will cover Docker, configuration management, testing, automation, releasing, and DevOps. Hopefully some of you recognize some of these from previous um, projects that you've been involved with. Docker affords all deployment styles to small teams. Configuration management is dying. QA teams are an organizational anti-pattern. Automate everything that you possibly can in code. Release early, release often, and be more DevOps. Removing blockers ensures the shortest path to enlightenment. So we want to feed off the generosity of the ecosystem. We can get a lot of things for free. So I'll assume that you're in stealth mode or aiming to spend as little money as possible. A lot of these things can be circumvented by throwing cash at them. But if we aim for the baseline, we can build from there. So, the recommendations will be free and, importantly, for private use on the assumption that you're not delivering open source code, this is aimed more at a business or an individual. The only expense you will incur using these tips is compute and bandwidth. While AWS does provide a free tier, these are burstable micro instances and are not really suitable for anything more than a very small deployment. Um, of course, time is money. So, continuous practices for small teams and individuals, minimal configuration, and enterprise config. So, assuming you have management buy-in, are competent and willing to learn, this is a self-reinforcing process that will ultimately set you free. So, release early, or die trying. It's not quite as easy as it may sound, but we're looking to remove friction between every step of the deployment process from your laptop through to your production servers. Humans are that process friction. So what do we do to remove humans from the chain? First of all, everything must be testable. From monolith to microservices to web applications to Electron on the desktop, everything is testable. Even now, you can inject WebDriver into an Electron app to give it the same coverage level as a browser-based application. There is some dispute around testing private methods, when should you surface business logic, but ultimately if the code is important to you in any way or due for a refactor, then it should be exposed and testable. There is a question of how much pain one is willing to tolerate to test a particular piece of code, but ultimately if it's of value to you or it's important, dogmatically hiding things, private methods and implementations away from the eye of an exposed API and therefore a test suite will not help you in the long run. 
Everything is testable. It's a question of how much pain one is willing to tolerate. So continuous integration is the first step on this journey. It's pulling together, everybody working in the same direction. Continuous deployment is your favorite furniture company designing an item, sawing it into pieces and delivering it to your door. Deployment is making it useful, doing the same thing over and over, always going forward, refining the process, but more importantly, removing the human interaction. The machines are in control. User acceptance testing is performed by actual users in this model. So the three Cs, continuous integration, performing a test on every commit, continuous delivery. If the code is passing the tests, then it's moved through production-like environments and placed close to production available for deploy. Continuous deployment, if every release candidate has passed the automated tests that we trust, then we ship it without human interaction. People are the process friction that slowed these things down, remove their input wherever possible. Not all of these techniques are suitable for everybody. There is no dogma here, and adherence to some of these principles will make your life easier. Air-gapped industries such as defense, healthcare, uh, finance, are probably more likely to want an air-gapped Faraday cage somewhere deep in a bunker, making some of these techniques more difficult. So different teams have different needs. But we want to avoid having code that we would like to ship but cannot. Reducing friction between laptops and production, getting build cycle times down constantly for fast feedback loops, maximizes your velocity. And things will be better, I promise. So continuous everything, best practices. Commit little and often to a main line. That's a single trunk, no branches. Test everything, automate everything else, relentlessly optimize the build chain, the cycle time, the length of time or latency it takes an individual user to get feedback on a proposed change to the systems that they're building, and radiate information, reduce the amount of repetition and communication that's required to maintain an agile team. So merging and rebasing. Merging and rebasing sucks. This is not continuous integration. Not just languishing branches, but everybody changes context all the time, and reintegration can be harder than writing the code. One requires the presence of the author of the merge and of the original code that's being merged into in order to determine the meaning of the logic at merge time. This is also most likely to be done out of context, so after the features have been delivered. One can throw people at the problem, but of course, that has its limit in Brooks' law. Adding manpower to a late software project makes it later. Too many connections, too many people, and things will stagnate in meetings. But more than one team on the same code base costs exponential communications pathways. So the PR branch Git flow model popularized by GitHub, wonderful for open source, a perfect match. There's unknown contributors. You need a review of everything because we encourage these contributions from the ether. And time is immaterial to an open source project. It's unlikely to have a hard deadline. It's bad, however, for teams with deliverables. We should be able to trust our colleagues. Agility is impacted because one is forced to wait for somebody to manually review a, a pull request. And this can also incite the sort of behavior where trailing semicolons or spaces are considered suitable reasons for rejecting a pull request, where actually what we're looking for is the veracity of the code. We're looking for static analysis to take care of those stylistic issues. We're looking for the test to take care of the behavior that we're looking for. So instead of a mandatory pull request or review step, why not pair program? Why not increase that and mob program? Gather a number of people around the keyboard, one person interchanging every 15 minutes, and at this stage, you have not only your entire team upskilling simultaneously as the working practices of others are seen by the rest of the group, the rationale for changes and for features and implementation is discussed. You're bringing everybody up to speed at the same time and disseminating information about the system and how you're working upon it amongst the team. Teach instead of reflect, tutor instead of profess, 
and continue to upskill everybody equally. So perhaps there's some compromise here. A new developer may require a little bit more effort than uh, a seasoned developer joining the project. Or a large feature may be too complex to feature toggle out, or you may not want to use feature toggles in the first place. And then maybe multiple developers are also on this feature. It seems then a branch is the appropriate way to do things. You then pay the time and complexity penalty of constantly rebasing your master back onto that branch and finally reintegrating it. You can use static analysis, tests, automated tooling to reduce some of this pain, and it's fine. But who really cares about your deadline? The people paying you to deliver this software. So there has to be a compromise. We have to strike a balance somewhere. We want to move as fast as possible whilst maintaining a baseline of quality. These are most people's favorite pyramids. People travel from all across the world to see them. This is my favorite pyramid. So in order to achieve the system tests, test the whole system in a fast, repeatable, low latency, as in low uh, cycle time manner, the whole or partial of the stack of your application must be deployable on a developer's laptop. This is where the new shiny tooling really dazzles. Facilitated by something like Docker Compose, one is able to declaratively define their stack and remove the pieces that you're not going to use for either the component under test or the tests that or the development or the tests that you're currently running and bring up that application locally, decreasing the time it takes you to identify bugs, to integrate with other components in the system. You have much greater visibility because your build server is then not running tests for the first time where you're throwing your code over the wall and hoping that the build server completes your tests in a speculative manner. Instead, you run your tests locally, reducing your feedback time, reducing the friction between yourself and production, and bringing the automation onto your laptop instead of waiting for the build server. We have to test people. If we don't test correctly, then all of these processes are null and void. So testing is dependent upon teams, dependent upon the context of your application, and different unit tests for, say, a React application versus browser-based tests, as in um, actually system ex uh, browser acceptance tests for that application, they have more value than, uh, depending upon the context of what you're actually testing. So there's various bits and bobs here just left in for posterity, but importantly, right overlaying lap overlapping layers of tests, test each user journey once, Never test the same thing tr twice, and trust that a passing test covers the case that it describes. There is so much information on the internet concerning test smells, patterns, best practices. It's worth going and spending some time ingesting, understanding, and it will refine your process and allow you to move quicker as we reduce the size of test suites and make them more applicable, as we ensure that we are adding new functions, adding new tests that are not duplicating previous bits of code because again, we're relying on these tests, but we don't want them to spiral out into a huge monolithic test suite that then requires its own maintenance window. We want to constantly be looking and maintaining those as if they were part of our application code. So where does a QA team add value? All of these things listed should be applicable to the developers in the organization. Are they doing your work for you? They should be thinking of destructive ways to break your code. This is the rationale for QA, not testing expected behavior. If you don't understand and own the domain of the software that you are developing, you risk not delivering the correct solution. So instead of throwing something to QA after it's completed, consider something like the Three Amigos technique, where you have a QA, a BA, and a developer prior to the card itself being, or feature being developed, and you consider, what are the edge cases here? What tests do we need to write? What integration points with the rest of the system are likely to cause us trouble? Build the tests before you start writing the code and utilize the naturally destructive nature of the QA's brain earlier in the process. The veracity of your application is proven by the tests that you write, not manual testing, and by deploying continuously and pushing to users, you're able to react 
responsively to user feedback and ship features and ship ship features and fixes far quicker. So, version control. This one's easy, right? Turns out everybody does it slightly differently. Google have their own post perforce version control system, which tests all code associated with a particular change on commits. This involves a static analysis, not only of the code under test, but also of the other points on the system. So it builds a dynamic dependency graph, as well as relying on a declarative one, to ensure that one change in, say, Google Mail does not affect the integration with Google Calendar. Facebook have a weekly merge window as a result of them using a monolithic PHP application. Developers have credit. And should they fail to ship the feature or the functionality that they have promised to ship, they receive less of that credit and ultimately can end up in a situation where they're not permitted to ship code anymore. GitHub, everything is chat ops. They popularize this and everything is performed in a Slack-like environment, pushing code, releasing server patches, etc. But all of these guys move more slowly than Amazon, who every 11.6 seconds ship a change to a server. They are, in my opinion, the industry leaders in this, and I'd be interested if anybody has done it faster. So, continuous best practices. We've been through shipping little and often to mainline, testing everything, what else do we have? Automate everything else. Relentlessly optimize the build chain and radiate information. Build, measure, learn, and repeat. Do more of what's going well, and less of what's going badly. So, with the first two covered, we can look towards what else is required for simple continuous deployment. We're going to keep this fast, free and private. All developers perform these first two actions on the list daily. But in order to get to simple continuous deployment, we need to be cats of all trades, generalizing specialists with a wide breadth of skills, but depth of understanding in specific topics. Anything can be learned in 20 hours to a reasonable level. That's two hours a weeknight for two weeks. You can learn anything. And for developers, ops guys, and testers, that means it's buzzwordy, it's marketing speak, but DevOps. This means show you care, support your code in production. This proves that you have confidence in yourself, in your team, in the processes that you've put in place to remove that friction, to reduce the human interaction, while reducing your team's bus factor and upskilling everybody equally. For ops guys, this means looking at the code, being involved in the application, understanding what it is that you're shipping to production, not treating code deploys as a black box to be pushed back to the developers upon failure. For Ops, uh, sorry, for application guys, it means access to servers. It means being able to dial into production should it be required and investigate the cause of a bug or a failure or even configuring logging for your applications, ensuring that you have access to perform these ops style functions. And for test guys, it means verifying system reliability and tolerances instead of manually verifying what developers have been supposed to achieve in their cards. So, with that brief call to arms, what development environment is best for continuous deployments? The barrier to enterprise deployment styles is pre-packaged immutable application units. This is what Google ships to their servers countless times daily. Also known as namespaces and C groups, also known as containers, and more popularly known as Docker. This provides Agility, repeatability. So from a development perspective, what are the advantages of developing inside a Docker container? Well, you're developing in your target environment. Your Mac's BSD-based system is not the Linux-based host that you'll most likely be deploying to. This brings the pain of integration forward and allows you more observation on what is actually being shipped to your servers. You can fix things with far tighter feedback loop on your laptop rather than production. The negative points, well, there are still file system watch issues with the Docker for Mac um, hypervisor and file system sharing. 
This does mean that development is a little bit more difficult, slightly stymied. However, you can fix these things. You only have to fix them once, and they'll be running for the rest of your environment by running inside your uh, container. It can be a little unwieldy, but we hope these things will be fixed before too long. There are some differences when you deploy a Docker container. It is not as transparent as it could be. The environment variables and the centralized config that your application is running, either that it pulls from a centralized server or the startup options that the Docker daemon, run, Docker daemon runs with or the startup options to the Docker client. These are all places that you could have a difference in configuration. There is only ever one kernel running on a machine running Docker. You may have kernels inside your Docker images themselves, but they're not used. All system calls are proxied through to the host kernel. This is only problematic in case, this is only problematic in case you're running an older 2.4, 2.6 branch Linux kernel. Since version four, these problems have more or less been tiled over. We have a homogenized syscall interface which supports all of the functionality that Docker requires to do its thing. However, be aware that if you do have strange differences, it could well be the host system. Your networking fabric may be different. Running on your local machine, you'll be going through a single loopback adapter, probably, or a bridge, whereas AWS have a different networking infrastructure to Google Cloud. If you're using a software-defined network, such as Weave or Flannel, they operate very slightly differently as well. All considerations, and never underestimate hardware for exposing race conditions. There is a benefit to running a whole large distributed application on a single machine. And that is that you are, by virtue of the compute resource available, putting the application under more stress than it would see in production. You're likely to have triggers which will scale your servers out above a certain load. On your local host machine, you don't have that capability. So you're exposing potential race conditions that would otherwise only be surfaced should your application be under exceptional load, be it by a mistake in your auto-scaling scripts or a denial of service attack of some description. So there is some benefit to doing this. However, one should be aware that things that appear on the local machine are not always present on production. Other container runtimes are available. This suffers from most of the same features as I've mentioned for Docker. Slightly less developer focused, but rapidly catching up as Rocket is integrated with a lot of the mainstream projects that Docker has been integrated with already. So the ability to spin up production-like environments at will aids bug reproduction, debuggability, development ease and speed, the ability to work offline, and isolation from others. Working on a shared central development server is a recipe for heartache. So, with this production-like system and a development environment that's re-repeatable and deterministic, we're almost there, but we're still missing one thing, and that is our application state. In order to maintain this system, debugging as closely as we can to production, we need a copy of production's data. So, automating a scrub job that will dump your production databases, remove any sensitive customer data that's in there, and push that into a Docker container, which you're then able to mount as a Docker volume, ensures that you're still running the same tests on your local machine as you are on CI, and they're indicative of your production environment. This again clears an entire class of bugs because you know that you are very close in terms of application state and the application itself to your live production systems. So, source control. What should we use? GitHub is the preeminent figure in this space. I'm sure we all use it regularly. However, they don't fulfill our criteria of free and private, so we'll strike them from the list. Bitbucket is rapidly coming up to speed with the other players, but in my opinion is still trailing, which leaves one final solution, GitLab. The UI takes a little bit getting, of getting used to, and I consider it less polished than GitHub in general, but there is a free Dockerized official release that is runnable with almost no efforts. It contains source control, a Docker registry, and a continuous integration and build service, which is more than the others offer currently. And all you have to maintain are your backups. There is also a hosted version, but the caveat here is that it's rather slow comparatively, although it does allow you to spin up 
free DigitalOcean droplets to run your own CI privately. So these uh, self-hosted version is, in my opinion, the better way to go. But the build server here is really a thing of beauty and magic. And the CI runner uses the now familiar Travis style YAML DSL. It is near feature parity with CodeShip and Travis, and it only lags behind the incredible complexity of Jenkins for configuration of big distributed system build jobs, which, have you done them, you probably would not wish to do again anyway. So provisioning. Now we've got something that we want to push into production. How do we get the servers up in the first place? Terraform is the, again, leading tool in this space. It allows you to cloud agnostically, more or less, define what services you'd like to bring up and do it all via the API. There is a slight caveat in that it contains no locking mechanism. So an addition called Terra Grunt uses the Amazon DynamoDB service to perform locking to prevent simultaneous deploys, which would, of course, leave you with a non-deterministic environment. There are plenty of places to deploy to. Obviously, AWS and G Cloud are the two fastest and best, in my opinion. But they also carry a hefty price tag. So the cheapest two servers, servers services, if you like, in my opinion, at the moment, are Scaleway and OVH, both based in France. And it's possible to spin up a heavy duty cluster on Scaleway for about 70 pounds. Uh, that really is a huge cluster. and I encourage you to go and have a look at their pricing. So deployment, freeze your dependencies. This is NPM shrink wrap for your application and for your Docker files, there must be a balance between security and upgradability. In order to get a deterministic Docker file build, one must specify the application versions for everything that you yum install, apt install, however, or APK, depending on what platform you're, what, uh, or distribution you're deploying to. Pinning those dependencies will result in deterministic builds with the same outputs every time. However, you miss security patches. So the balance becomes, is it better to expose yourself to the potential risk of an incorrect or backwards incompatible upgrade from an OS maintainer versus the same thing from an NPM package maintainer? You're probably exposed slightly more with NPM because there's a less rigorous testing process that goes in place. That will become, again, context dependent upon how much determinism you require there. So these artifacts are essentially ephemeral, which means that should we suffer a catastrophic failure, we should be able to just press a button and have everything rebuilt from scratch, that determinism being a case in point. But if you're making money, it's definitely worth using a registry service of some description and backing up your application images. So deployment, there are three main solutions for hosting complex Docker-based scenarios at the moment. Should you just want to push a single container, then maybe something like Elastic Beanstalk will do for you. But Docker Swarm is shipped with Docker at this point, as of version 112, and provides rudimentary application um, scheduling capabilities. It's rapidly catching up but is considered far less feature complete than the other two. Mesos was born out of Twitter and is a result of years of their engineering expertise. It's rather complicated. It puts an abstraction over your servers to treat them as resources rather than just deployment targets, um, but it is complex enough to be able to host Kubernetes itself. And the third one here is Kubernetes. This was born from Google's experience with their internal Borg scheduler they actually committed the first lines of code into the Linux kernel around C groups about eight years ago, which began the container revolution, if you like. That project, Kubernetes, has seen the fastest adoption and uptake of any of these projects. The number of committers on GitHub is frankly incredible, and enterprise adoption is huge. There have been multiple stories recently of people moving away from Mesos onto Kubernetes. There is also a hosted Kubernetes in the Google Container Engine service, which uh, confusingly is GKE, to disambiguate from the Google Compute Engine. Um, and Azure have just announced that they also now provide Kubernetes hosting, um, although that may be taking a slight punt with your infrastructure. So Kubernetes, with its huge code base, in my opinion, will be the victor. 
in the container scheduling wars. If that's complex, or if it seems complex, it's because it is slightly complex. One has to appreciate the nuances of running a distributed system. There are various other things to learn, which are all tremendously interesting, should you have the inclination. However, there are platforms as a service which will install very easily on top of Kubernetes. Flynn is Heroku-like. Deus contributed the Kubernetes package manager into core and is probably the most feature complete again. Um, I recommend that you appraise these for your own use cases. So we're scheduling an application. We provisioned the services. We now want to know what it's doing. So logging. Post mortem debugging or just standard runtime, we need to have our logs shipped somewhere off our infrastructure. And the Elk stack, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana is industry standard at this point. Docker offers a number of different logging drivers. You can ship your logs remotely directly from the container. You can ship them to your host and then ship those remotely, which does give you local debuggability without having to leave your infrastructure. But if you use Logstash, you can ship directly to this service. Logs.io have a free tier with three days retention, and this is sufficient to inspect most log-related errors that you need to find. It's also enough to power alerting. So any of these guys will provide remote HTTP-based pings to ensure that your service is up and have a free tier. Or you could do something more complex, like use Zapier to wire together some of these services, giving you SMS or phone call alerts or wiring directly into Slack. If you don't want to do that yourself, Stackstorm is an event-driven automation solution, and I quote, used for auto-remediation of security and other events, as well as chat ops. This means you can trigger various remediations based on application states and infrastructure. If you have a problem once, you can automate the fix for it and repair it automatically in the future. Back to the mantra, of ensuring that everything is automated. BIP.io is the precursor to Stackstorm, but sadly had about six months of downtime on their public-facing website. It's still a wonderful project, but I urge you to do your own due diligence before adopting it. Open source, of course. So that's the minimum required for continuous deployment. Most of it's free, but what happens if we want to scale out? We need some sort of load balancer. Potential downtime while well, that's occurring and visibility of the system, so we could do better. Complex pipelines, let's keep it free and private again. So, importantly, deployment types. We have blue, green, we have canary, and we have the Brian Lara hit and hope. <laughs> One of these costs twice as much as the production stack. One of them has inherent application complexity, and one of them is human driven. Canary is my preference. So the application complexity trade-offs are involved in always maintaining compatibility between the versions of services that you're deploying. This is backwards compatibility through the whole stack. So the way a Canary deploy would work, you have one to n versions of a, an image or an application running in production and you want to deploy the next version. So you put one of those new versions alongside the rest of those images. You route a small amount of traffic through to the new version, checking for elevated error rates for your response codes, checking all your logging and metrics to ensure that everything is within the agreed bounds and tolerances that you've designed the system to run at. You continue to roll the service out gradually. And as long as everything is within those prearranged pre-configured tolerances, you remove the previous version from deployment. At that stage, it's recommended to also to perform a post-deployment smoke test. At any point, you could roll back that version, rolling the previous version back in in the same manner to ensure that everything is running correctly. This used to be the domain of complex enterprise deployments, but some tooling has emerged in the last year to do a lot of this work for you. LinkD is built on top of Finnegal, a production-tested RPC framework from Twitter, used by Pinterest, Tumblr, PagerDuty, and a number of others. Simply, it allows testing continuous deployment. It will automatically perform this traffic rollover that I've been speaking about, and it will facilitate canary deployments for you. Envoy is an open source 
application service proxy open sourced by Lyft recently. It's new to the market, but promises more than Linkerd does, but ultimately provides the same application load balancing functionality. Layer four and seven routing, TLS termination, service discovery, health checking, and a multitude of statistics to surface application states. These are things that we no longer need to worry about, including in our application code. Microservices by design are heterogeneous. They may be written in multiple different, version, different languages. And as such, maintaining common service discovery or circuit breaking code requires re-implementation of the same logic across multiple languages. This is a waste of time and can now be sped up and the process lubricated by use of an application load balancer. So if we're good, we've started to move traffic over. For green and blue, this would be a DNS cutover, but we're running canary deployments. What's left? Well, the state of our application, databases. With the spirit of always maintaining backwards compatibility, we should add columns and begin to write to them, performing migrations online in the application source code itself. This ensures that should the rollout version fail and require rolling back, we are not breaking our database by renaming columns that are no longer available. We don't have to write rollback scripts for databases. The amount of load that we endure running database migrations is huge. So breaking it into smaller parts, making the change, rolling out the new versions, and allowing database changes to settle for days or weeks before finally removing them will aid, again, in removing another class of bugs. And deployment time bugs are the very worst. So are these things true? Automation solves anything. Well, testers are non-deterministic, not repeatable. Is manual testing obsolete? Well, developers need to own their own domain. We can push this UAT ex user acceptance testing onto the users themselves. It works on my machine. Docker means there's some difference in kernel and network, et cetera, possibly data. But generally, this is the case. You can push the same unit from production, from laptop through to production. And my part works fine. We can work on the whole system. We should have no boundaries. So catastrophe survival, what to do when it all goes wrong? Ideally, we always fix forward. We don't fail. We continuously improve. The baseline just slips a touch. We embrace failure. Write a failing test case. Stop the deployment pipeline. Can we see why it's broken? Has our logging monitored? Has our logging triggered this? Have, have our alerts fired in the right places? If not, why not? We're continuously learning and monitoring everything. Dogmas, no good, of course. During an emergency, you may have a short fuse, not a lot of time to get the system back up, in which case we roll back to the previous known good states. Again, our slow and methodical database column migrations make this easy. We should still write tests for the new bug to ensure that what we're doing, or the problem that surfaced, does not affect the current version. We try and reproduce the production error locally. Pray it's not a Heisen bug. Based on Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, things that differ under observation, Docker should reduce this possibility. But in the case that it doesn't, we can investigate the things mentioned earlier, the kernel configuration, the fabric, the environmental config. Could it be a race condition? We can attach a debugger. There is a new breed of system observability tools that run asynchronously. Sysdig intercepts syscalls via an installed system module. This is different to strace, because strace will block your application's runtime as it pushes, pushes its debug output to the console. Dtrace was originally a Sun product, now available for Linux, merged in with 4.9 kernel, so it may take some time to hit long-term support releases. And finally, the Berkeley packet filter framework is a raw interface to the data link layers. This means diagnosing communication issues in a repeatable and scriptable manner. So how do we fix this? We create a failing test case. We commit it. We're running a production-like version of our environment on CI for this reason. And we re-enable the pipeline. We're back to continuous deployment. So remember, not all of these techniques are for everybody. But adoption of some of them will make your life easier. So in conclusion, Docker's brought large-scale deployment possibilities to small teams. There's no barrier to adopting these enterprise patterns. Kubernetes is informed by the inner workings of Google. Let them handle that complexity for you. Traditional configuration management is dying. Application config belongs in containers. It's more important to have containers and servers that provision correctly and can be used locally. Terraform will help you with this. 
QA teams are an organizational anti-pattern. Bring their expertise into the development process early. Don't have them fixing and verifying the state of your application after you've deployed it. Automate everything as code, tests, pipeline, deployment, alerting, and be more DevOps. Be a generalist, knowledge is power. Upscale your teams, measure, learn, and improve continually. Show you care, support your code and production. And all these things will allow you to release early, release often, ship features, fix bugs, and go home on time. Thank you.